How you guys, Dave? Mad Max Six, and we're back at the Mecca. This is Be Built by Browser. Eric, how are you, man? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. <laughs> I, I love this weather. This weather is like spectacular. It's just like in high 60s, low 70s. Nice breeze, overcast. I'm I'm in heaven right now. <laughs> Does that remind you of New York a little bit? <laughs> it, remind, it reminds me of New York, like uh, like in the end of summer or maybe yeah. the beginning of spring, like yeah, that yeah. kind of feel. Indian but summer. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. All right, so what do we got this week? Uh, give, I, mean, I know that, uh, and I, I like that actually, you actually went on social media to tell people a little bit what's coming. Uh, so that's kind of cool. But uh, you have some questions from the fans again this week? Yeah, um, well, I mean, today's show, we have a few good things. We have, uh, first of all, you're a week out of your show, or a little bit less than a week, when you and I are gonna train some arms today, so we're gonna do that. Uh, and also, I wanted to demonstrate uh, a couple of the chest exercises, uh, the, um, the bench press to the neck yeah. on the Smith and also the reverse grip uh, uh, bench press on the Smith that we discussed last week for building the upper chest. I think it'd be good to yeah. show them today. And then, of course, I have a bunch of questions from uh, Ask Merlin Monday, and I'm actually I'm answering all of them here, right here on the show rather than, uh, you know, on, on Facebook. So. It's probably more fun for them. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, these are good questions and they're good for the show and they're not like not going to take me two hours to answer, so right. <laughs> that's a good question. So I wrote them down, All right. and we'll start off with that. Okay. First thing is, actually, last week on the last show, we demonstrated the, or I demonstrated the seated calf raise, the mm -hmm. way that I do seated calf raise, yep. and I got a very good response from that. A lot people of good were feedback, telling me, huh? yes, people yeah. were telling me, I tried it, and it absolutely hit the soleus a lot harder than they've ever felt before. But a few people asked me, they said, because I didn't mention it, they said, what's the best rep range mm. uh, for seated calf? Uh, and actually, it's a good question because the, the soleus muscle, which is primarily worked uh, during seated calf raises, is actually a, a slow twitch uh, fiber dominant muscle as compared to the gastrocnemius so or the other part of the calf. So, actually, you want to go generally, not always, but generally higher reps when you do the seated calf raises. Uh, somewhere 12 and above is usually better for muscle growth for the soleus. Uh, than it is in the gastrocnemius, you can work a little bit um, with a little bit less reps. So, just basically, when you're working the seated calf raise, you want to go higher reps because there's a lot of slow twitch muscle fibers. That's a good question. Um, but I have my list here because otherwise, I'll forget to say I'm bringing my piece of paper. Um, okay, I was asked by um, somebody named uh, Mike Butler uh, on my page. He asked me, he said, um, BCAs are obviously useful um, uh, when, we're, when we're working out. Uh, but on days where we're not working out, would you be wasting our time using the BCAAs? And the answer to that question is, no, you wouldn't, because BCAAs are, you know, valuable um, uh, for for energy, for for you know, for an anabolism and everything. Even on days where you're not working out, um, I wouldn't say that they're necessarily essential on days you're not working out. But if they're part of your budget, um, I, I've always been successful using BCAAs, even on my non-training days. I usually wake up first thing in the morning. Um, and I'll have my BCAs, and I'll also tend to use them in between meals, especially um, when I'm feeling hunger pangs, when I'm feeling like my blood sugar is a little bit <clears throat> low, or when I'm feeling extra hungry and it's not, you know, and I'm not going to eat for another <clears throat> hour or so. I'll take some BCAs, and that usually takes care of the hunger pangs. It stabilizes my blood sugar, and of course, BCAs are great for muscle growth. Um, it's not, I, I'd say that it's more essential when you're dieting, and you're in a cutting phase, and the calories are lower, protein yeah. is lower, carbs are lower, but to be using BCAs on training days, on non-training days. So I'm not gonna say that they are essential, like you have to use them on non-training days, but obviously they are valuable. It's a valuable supplement to use on training days and non-training days. Um, and especially while cutting. So Good question. Uh, go ahead and use your BCAs on non-training days. Yep. Uh, another question from Fentress Lane, and he asked, this is a pretty general question, but he said, why are people so ignorant about nutrition and training properly? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, we wouldn't have a job otherwise. I don't know, <laughs> that's why I'm here. Um, you know, it's funny, I think that it's kind of a strange paradox because, you know, years ago before the internet, you know, um, there was so much less information available to people. Uh, so it was much harder to learn proper training principles and diet principles. The only really source was the magazines, which are all obviously where professional bodybuilders were. And we can't really learn, yes, we can learn from some professional bodybuilders, but I don't think they're always the best source because professional bodybuilders, 
you know, are normally genetic freaks. You know, those are the guys who build muscle way more easily than, than, than normal people do. Um, they can make training mistakes, they can overtrain, they can undertrain, they can undersleep, they can undereat, and they'll still make gains. When, when you're just of average genetics, that's not gonna happen. But now in the days of, you know, of the internet, uh, there's so much available information, which is a good thing and a bad thing because there's a ton of good information, there's a ton of bad information because yeah. a lot of people out there are not qualified yeah. to be giving out advice um, and you may be reading their advice uh, and, and getting the wrong information from people who aren't experts. And then again, you also get the problem of this person says this thing, this person says that thing, what do I do? This person says six reps, this person says 20, this person says 10 sets, this person two. So it gets a little bit crazy. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, obviously, it's just like anything else. I mean, you know, you have, uh, you know, people who, will, you know, they play golf, but they go to golf experts to learn to play golf better. You have people who play baseball, but they have coaches, football coaches. So, I mean, just like, you know, in any sport or any activity, physical activity like that, you know, you need to have a coach or, some, or a mentor or somebody to look to. So, you know, I don't know why, I think that in this day and age, people should be knowledgeable. And I think most people are more knowledgeable about everything, but just be very careful about the person that you listen to. Look at their track record. Um, you know, make sure that some of the things that they're saying is backed up by science. You know, we know that there's, um, you know, science that just seems to be applicable in the lab it's not applicable in the real world there's some things that happen in the real world that you know maybe the lab doesn't back up but you know try to just look at both sides of it um, look at scientific studies look at what's happening in the gym look at your mentor or your coach or the person that you know you're looking to um, see you know the people that they've trained that they've worked with look at their own physique um, try different philosophies uh, and see what works for you too because we're all individuals and some people you know <clears throat> I think there's some general principles that work very well for everybody but um, you know we're all gonna have some individual differences so you also have to be your own lab rat and you have to you know be your own you know um, scientist and and make sure that you know you are trying different things on yourself to see what works for you but um, I don't know I mean I think in this day and age you really have to um, understand that there is so much information out there and it's at your fingertips and you can go get it uh, but just be careful with it, see who it's coming from, um, and make sure that you're picking the right person to listen to uh, and experiment with different philosophies. So, I don't know, Ventress. I'm here and I'm doing my best uh, <laughs> to try to teach uh, proper principles on training, uh, and diet, and supplementation, and I hope that I'm helping a lot of people. So, uh, next up, uh, Tim Boylan. <laughs> hey, Tim. What's up, Tim? I picked out another one of your questions because you sent me an email. Tim sent me an email. He said, I'm sending you like six or seven questions that you can use. And I found a good one. Okay. <clears throat> um, he wanted to know, how often do you move the grip positions? Like when you're doing presses or pull downs or laterals, you know, you know, from set to set or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and if you've been watching the show, you know that I'm very, very big on constantly changing things up. It doesn't always have to be different exercises. It can be different grips. It can be slightly different angles of push or pull. You know, pulling, doing a seated pull down to the front, to the top of the chest, um, is gonna work the muscles differently than leaning back a little bit and pulling it to the lower part of the chest. I mean, that's basically the same exercise, but you're just changing the angle of the body. You know, when I'm working with Dave, uh, and we're doing, you know, workouts here, a lot of times I'll say, Dave, on the first set, I want your hands close on the curls. On the second set, I want your hands medium. On the third set, wide or with the presses, or <clears throat> in an earlier show I demonstrated with professional bodybuilder Abbas Katami, uh, that doing a, a curl with a dumbbell and holding the dumbbell in the middle versus holding it all the way to the one side versus the other side changes the way the muscle has to pull the weight. Um, so you're going to recruit different motor unit pools. Now I think this is more important for people who are more advanced. Now if you're a beginner, Really, there's no reason to be changing grips and angles and everything constantly. You just want to work the basics and get stronger and have proper form. As you to become a, an, you know, an intermediate trainer, you want to have a little bit more variety in exercises, a little bit more variety in machines and free weights and cables and that kind of stuff. And then when you move into the more advanced phases, you know, you want to start changing grips and angles because you, your body is so used to training and it's been had the same exercise over and over again uh, that you just by changing the grips and angles and angles of pull and, and, and foot stance on leg presses and squats, you know, you will hit different motor unit pulls, and this is the way we reach our full genetic potential. So, um, it's not something that I, sometimes I do it within the workout, within the sets. Sometimes I'll change it workout to workout. I really don't have a set, like, this is how I do it. 
sometimes sometimes it's inst instinctual. Uh, sometimes if I'm especially if I'm looking at myself or if I'm looking at a client, I may look at a muscle group and say, well, you know, I feel like your outer biceps need more work, and you can. While you can't isolate it, you can target it. Uh, so I'll, you know, I'll be using grips or angles that you know will be hitting that portion of the muscle. So, you know, again, just be your own scientist. Change it up now and again. Doesn't have to be all the time, but the longer you've been training, the more variety you want to have. The final question I have, and this one I picked out for a specific reason, mm. <laughs> is from uh, Max Angle, and he's asked me many questions before. He's one of my great clients as well. Uh, just uh, won his last competition just a few weeks ago. He wants to know what my dream client is. He said, who would I want to work with in the film industry or athletes or any client if I had the chance? It's you, Max. <laughs> well, it is. Actually, that's part of the way I'm going to answer the question. I already do have a lot of dream clients. My dream clients, I'll answer this in two ways. My dream clients are clients that, not that they don't question me, but that they have faith in me and that they, everything that I set them out to do, you know, I say, do this workout, do this diet, no matter how hard it is, they have a goal and they do it. So, Max, you're like that. Dave, you're like that. Uh, Jonathan Douglas, you're like that. Mark Deronda, you're like that. I have a lot of clients like that, and if I'm forgetting anybody, I, I'm sorry, but there are a lot of clients I have like that, and there are other clients who don't, you know, who aren't dream clients in no sense because they don't, you know, they may miss meals or this or that. You know, and I understand sometimes it's for good reason or for reasons that, you know, family reasons or work reasons or health reasons. Uh, but you know, if you don't have those reasons, I do want you to follow to a T. And if you're following to a T and you're getting the, re that's how we get the results. That's a dream client. But I'm gonna answer this question in another way also. And this is just something I've, you know, I've been thinking about for a while. I have, do have another dream client. I've become very close with a gentleman named Jay Cutler. You may have heard of Jay. <laughs> I can't believe you're talking about that on camera. I'm gonna talk about it on camera. I'm gonna talk about it on camera. No, this is just a personal thing. Okay. Jay's a great guy. Um, and I, you know, I, I recently saw him the other day and I was saying to Dave, I'm like, Dave, man, this guy, he's still giant. He's still a freak. And I know that he's barely eating his meals. He's trains, you know, when he can. When he can yeah. You know, and I, you know, and I looked at, you know, I looked at the guys at the Olympia this year, and I just turned to Dave and I said, Dave, this guy could still go into the Olympia and win. So, this is just a personal thing I'm throwing out there. I would love, my dream client would be love for Jay to say, let's win this thing one more time, and and I would love to train him uh, for the Olympia and have him come back and win it for a fifth well, time. Let me ask you a question. Do you you follow the Olympia for decades? You know, just like I have. You're a fan of good sports. And you've seen Jay since he's started yep. competing. Do you feel like he's reached his full potential as of yet? I think that in 2001, and I think most people will agree, 2001 and 2009 were his two best years. Yes. Um, you think it's the best he can do? Slightly different looks, but no, I don't think that he's at his best yet. I think that Jay has not quite explored. His training has always been one-dimensional. His dieting has always been... Uh, sort of hit or miss in, in a way you know um, the final I know that a lot of times in the final week um, he's changed things up he's had a lot of different things going on and he's always had you know problems peaking properly a lot of times we've seen him in pictures two weeks out before a show and he looks amazing yeah. in it. In the, even though he still goes in and wins a show because he's so damn good you know he's not as good as he was two weeks before so I still think that there's things that Jay can do especially with training uh, that can bring out more detail in his physique in certain areas that he's never had before. Um, and I think that it's the perfect time for him to do it because I mean, if you look at somebody like Dexter Jackson who like is just defying odds and he's old. older than Jay yeah. and he's now getting better and you know he, he just went into this Olympia and when people were writing him off a few years ago and now he probably has in his mind, hey, man, I might be able to win this thing because there right. are a lot of people who thought he should have won this this past Olympia this recently. So good. He looks so good. Um, and I think Jay can do the same thing. So, you know, I'm just saying, you're asking me a, a dream client, and I don't know if Jay wants to come back ever or, you know, Jay's doing great and God bless him for everything he does. He's still just as popular now as he was before, yeah. but that would be my dream. That would be my dream for Jay to say, you know what? The fire is lit. I'm going to go back and I'm going to take it back from Phil Heath. Um, and it would be so cool, you know, um, wow. you know they're good friends and everything. And uh, I know that um, I could bring out things in Jay's physique that uh, we've never seen before. So no, I don't think he's at his full potential. I still think that there's one higher gear.
that he has over what you saw in 2001 and 2009. And, um, and I believe that he could do it because the man is, uh, he's unbelievable. I mean, like yeah. I said, he's just, he's just a, a walking freak of nature. And anyway, and, and when he gets into something, he works so hard that, you know, nobody works harder. So yeah. anyway, that's all my questions for today. That's <laughs> a big statement, Merlin. Hi, right. what Thank the you. hell? <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, so last week, on last week's show, I had a question asked about upper chest, if there was any special movements that I do to build my upper chest, because I built a pretty good upper chest, um, I think. And, um, Two of the movements that I mentioned was uh, bench presses to the neck on the Smith machine, which we have demonstrated before, but we did that quite a while ago, so I'm going to demonstrate them again. And also an unusual movement uh, that most people didn't realize builds the upper chest, which is the reverse grip bench press, which studies have shown uh, uh, gives about a 40% higher activation of upper chest muscles than even incline presses. So that's an interesting fact. So I'm going to demonstrate both movements. I'm going to start with the guillotine or the press to the neck and show you how I do those on a Smith machine. And again, I prefer to do these on a Smith machine because it's more control, especially when you're pressing down to the neck. Okay, like always, when I'm pressing, the first thing I do is I set my body properly, my torso. So I'm actually rolling my shoulders down, I'm getting my chest up high and a slight arch in the lower back so the chest does the pressing, not the triceps and the shoulder. Relatively wide grip on the bar. As you see, my elbows are going to be out. Right to the top of the chest, the bottom of the neck. Keeping that chest high in that arch position. Full stretch. Full stretch. Okay, again, so the important part to that movement, again, as you saw, is I set my torso properly, which is keeping the rib cage and the chest up high, a little arch in the lower back and the shoulders down, rolled down and back into the bench, which again sets up the chest in a better position for pressing, so the chest is doing more of the movement than the shoulders and the triceps. Um, also, as you saw, the bar was coming down pretty much to the top of my chest. Anywhere between the top of the chest and the Adam's apple is okay, depending on your shoulder flexibility. Uh, you want to come down to feel a full stretch. Don't go down so far that you necessarily touch your neck. You might overstretch the shoulders, um, and the elbows stay out nice and wide. And as I can't, came down to the bottom, I even pushed my chest out a little bit higher to even get a little bit more stretch in the chest. Um, you know, you can work pretty heavy in this movement once you get used to it, but always make sure you control that negative. Make sure that you do not let that bar drop down, especially if it's too dangerous. So the second exercise that um, I want to show you is the reverse grip bench press. And again, this doesn't have to be done on a Smith. Uh, I like doing it better on a Smith because I have more control and because of something that I like to do during the movement, uh, which you won't actually see me do, so I'm just going to describe it here. When I do the reverse grip bench press and I come down to my chest, what I'm actually doing is instead of pushing straight up, I'm actually pushing up and back as if I was trying to push the bar back over my head. Obviously, it won't do that because it's pressed up against the machine. But by pushing back, you'll actually activate the upper chest even more. So it's really just something you want to think about doing during this movement. You can't do that with a free bar because if you try to do that, you lose control of the bar. So this is how we do this, uh, the uh, reverse grip bench press. Again, setting the torso, arch and lower back, shoulders roll down, chest up high. Wide grip. Pushing up and back. That exercise you saw was bringing the bar down probably to about nipple level. That's where I like it. That's where I feel it the most. Experiment a little bit. You might feel it better a little bit lower, a little bit higher. 
You can also experiment with the angle of the bench. Uh, somebody actually asked me, is it even better to do those on an incline? I don't think it's better to do those on an incline. I like that closer to flat position because you can get pushed back and over the over your head, which really gives that upper chest activation. But you can experiment a little bit. You might even want to try a little decline or a very slight incline uh, just to change it up. Again, just change up the movement. But don't go too heavy on this movement when you start with it because it's it's not an easy movement to get. It's awkward. It's a little bit awkward. It's awkward especially because of that reverse grip. Mm -hmm. Be careful when you're holding the bar. Hold it nice and tight in your hands. You don't want that dropping on you. And again, always remember, pushing up and back over your head against the bar and you'll force some really good upper chest activation. And I should also say, because this is on a Smith machine, there's a lot of times where I would actually superset these two movements, the guillotine to the neck, mm. get about you know eight to 10 reps, near failure, and then just reverse my hands right around and do, a, uh, do the reverse grip bench press. So it's a great set as well that you could do here. So go ahead, try these movements and uh, build that shelf on the top of the chest. All right. Just try up. Stay there. Turn to the back. Just getting a little more muscular, sure, up front. Not in the mirror, just getting more muscular. 